So which brings us to our last question. Christian humility, because John Piper was just screaming. <laughs> if you take your stand against the culture, if you, take your, if you let words come out of your mouth in a blog or in a sermon or in a conversation at work, you let words come out of your mouth that the culture has considered, that's canceled. Um, then you will be accused of arrogance and other bad names. But I'm most concerned about arrogance because God hates arrogance. God hates pride. He hates it more than adultery. And, and the question is, will the accusation of pride tomorrow, say, or let's say Monday, at work, you have just spoken an opinion and they bristle. You say, you believe that? Yeah, I do. Why? I believe God taught that in his word. What if the next sentence is, who are you to speak for God? That's the most arrogant sentence I've ever heard come out of a human mouth. Now what? Now what? That's where we're going to end, is trying to come to terms with that. It's not new that the world has hijacked the word arrogance and equated it with conviction. It's not new that the world has hijacked the word humility and equated it with uncertainty. The reason I say it's not new is because G.K. Chesterton uh, wrote this in 1908. We suffer today, uh, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition and modesty has settled on the organ of conviction where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself and undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, 1908, nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. And the part that he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine reason or truth. We are on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. So if, if humility is not the abandonment of conviction and humility is not the embrace of uncertainty, what is it? We're called in the New Testament <clears throat> to have confidence. Confidence that is so strong that if you are beaten with rods or whips and then released, you rejoice. That much confidence. They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So I'm going to just tell you five things that Christian humility is and then will be done. Number one, humility, Christian humility, begins with a sense of subordination to God in Christ. Matthew 10, 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, <clears throat> nor a slave above his master. He's under, sub ordination. That's where humility starts. I am not God. <laughs> it's a great sentence. I have I've tried for about a year to get on my knees once a day 
for 30 seconds and say, I am not God. <laughs> you hear me, Lord? I'm totally okay with that. You are I'm not. I mean, to live that way with my wife and everybody else. First Peter 5, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So we need to feel this, not just know this. We need to feel this. God is above. I am beneath. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. The distance between me and God is infinite. His greatness, power, wisdom, justice, truth, holiness, mercy, grace are as high above me as the heavens are above the earth. So I'm not God. Point number one, humility begins with a sense of sub sub Ordination. I'm going down. He must increase. I must decrease. Every day, I'm low. He's high. If you don't start there, humility will become a virtue in which you can boast. Number two, humility does not feel a right to better treatment than Jesus got. This is probably the hardest, most radical, most necessary to hear in our day. Humility does not feel a right, an entitlement for better treatment than Jesus got. Matthew 10, 25. If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, to the, the devil, if they call Jesus the devil, which he did, how much more will they malign those of his household? Like, if you haven't been called the devil, something's wrong. That sounds like that anyway. If they call the master of the house the devil, how much more will they malign the members of his household? So humility does not produce a life based on perceived rights and a sense of entitlement. You move through life with, I got my rights, I got my rights, I got my rights. I got entitlement, I got entitlement. That's not a humble mind. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you can follow. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but handed over to him who judges justly. That's 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23. Much of John Piper's anger, and, and I, I think that's my most uh, hair-trigger likely sin, I'm not, my marriage to Noel, which we celebrated 50 years of last December, has not been threatened by adultery or pornography. That has not been my uh, battle front. Anger has. I'm an angry man. You can hear it probably in my voice, right? I, I get loud quick. I, I get ticked at the culture. I'm just wired to be upset with stupidity <laughs> and, and falsehood and Christ dishonoring things. Now, so I'm, I'm probably crossing that line between, you know, what do we call it? Uh, righteous anger and unrighteous anger. I'm probably crossing that line every day. Thank God for the gospel, right? So these texts mean much to me. I mean, they're after me. They're after me all the time. Christ gave you an example. No deceit was found in his mouth. He committed no sin. When he suffered, he did not threaten. When he was reviled, he didn't return evil for evil. But he kept handing over to him who judges justly. Go follow him. George Otis said, and boy, when I heard it, this is about 1985, I heard this. George Otis said, Jesus never promised his disciples a fair fight. I thought, that is so right. And how many of you get bent out of shape when you're in the fight and you're like, that wasn't fair. I didn't say that. You said I, said I didn't say that. They lied about Jesus all the time. That's how he got killed. 
He said he's going to tear down the temple, raise it up in three days, kill him. And they did. So probably you will die from slander. Some of you, slander. Not, it's, it's an, they said lots of true things about me and I get to die a glorious romantic life on the mission field. No, they're going to lie about you. And you'll die because they said false things about you and it won't be glorious. It'll be Jesus-like. So I just plead with you that if, if you want to be humble like Jesus, who didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, then you can't walk through life with a sense of entitlement and rights as if you should be treated better than Jesus. Who do you think you are? Number three, humility asserts truth not to bolster the ego with control or with triumphs in debate, but humility asserts the truth as an honor to Christ and as love to others. There is a difference between trying to win an argument and trying to love people with truth. 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love rejoices in the truth. If truth is an instrument of salvation, which it is according to 2 Thessalonians 2.10, they perish because they did not receive a love of the truth so as to be saved. If, tr if truth is an instrument of salvation, then we love people by speaking the truth about salvation. If truth is an instrument of sanctification, which it is, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth, then we'll speak that truth as a Christ-exalting expression of love. If the truth is an instrument of liberation and joy, which it is, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free, then we will speak the truth in the service of Christ-exalting love and freedom, no matter what anybody says. Because we've seen in the Bible that's what truth does. It sets people free. And if they don't want to hear you say it, we're still going to love them with it. So speaking the truth that others need to hear, whether they want to or not, is an honor to Christ and love to them. Number four, yep, two more. Humility knows and feels that it's dependent for everything on grace. On dependent on for knowing, dependent for believing, dependent for acting, dependent for breathing. Everything. Matthew 16, 17. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. The basic knowledge that Peter had that Jesus was the Christ was the gift of God. Ephesians 2 8. By grace are you saved through faith. It's not your own doing. This is a gift of God not of works, so that nobody will boast. Your faith, if you're a believer, was a gift. God gave it to you. Philippians 2, 12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is the one who is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. So all of our growth in grace, all of our meager successes in holiness are a gift of God working in us. And the simplest plans... I'll be home by 10. Hilton, four minutes away. I told him, I'll hang out for an hour. Let's get there by 10. You think I'm going to get there by 10? I could be dead by 10. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a quotation from the Bible. James 4, 15. You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that, like get to the Hilton by 10. If the Lord wills, Piper will be in his bedroom at 10, ready for an early flight tomorrow morning. And if he doesn't, you won't get there by 10. God is God. Humble yourself under his mighty hand, you planner of your evening. And say, 
if the Lord wills, I will get to the Hilton by 10 and feel it and love it. I don't run my life. God is God. Who do we think we are thinking we can get here or there and do this or that and breathe? <laughs> I only sleep on my left side. I do not know why I can't sleep on my right side. And I can't sleep on my back. Sleep on my left side, like a little baby, like this. <laughs> and regularly, I drop my hand down and take my pulse. <laughs> you know why I do that? I really do that. Kind of funny. Because when I feel that little boom, 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 I say, any one of those could be the last. I have zero control over that little boom, boom, boom. None. What a good thought to go to bed on. <laughs> just to settle it, you, know, you, talk, you talk to Jesus, you just, you just say to Jesus, now Jesus, I'm not in control of this, you are. I have no idea whether this is my night. Frankly, I would love to die in my sleep, but not to tell you what to do. <laughs> what, what I mainly want to do right now in the last two minutes before I go to sleep is to make sure it's good between us. <laughs> I love you. I trust you. I'm a sinner. You're my only hope. If this heart stops at 3 a.m. and I'm asleep, I'll be with you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the blood. That's just a great way to go to sleep. You ought to do that regularly. You know, don't be legalistic about it. But. <laughs> okay, so the, the fourth, and, and I'm almost done, the fourth um, trait of humility is that humility knows and feels that we are dependent on grace for all knowing, believing, acting, breathing. You walk through life and you just know he's God. I'm not, and, and everything I receive is a gift. Lastly, humility knows and feels that it is fallible. And so considers criticism and learns from it. And also knows that God has made provision for unshakable human conviction and that he calls us to persuade others. You hear the kind of paradox, right? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. That's a humble posture. I'm not infallible. I don't know everything. There's much I need to learn. I, I, I'm, if, I'm not in, if I'm not infallible and you have a beef with me, it would be wise for me to just hear you out. I might reject everything you say, but maybe not because you might see something I don't see. It's good to be married, by the way. <laughs> it's really good to be married. My wife has spared me many imbe imbecilities, <laughs> stupid things that I shouldn't say. Um, Proverbs twelve fifteen: a wise man is he who listens to counsel. So we're not God, we're sinners, we're finite, we're culturally conditioned, and therefore we're fallible, and therefore James says we make many mistakes with our mouths. James 3, remember? Make many mistakes. If a man, if a man that makes no mistakes with his mouth, he's, he's got his whole body control. He's a perfect man, which is not true for anybody except Jesus. So we must remain teachable. Where would you go for a verse on teachability? A humble person is a teachable person. Like if you come after, up here afterwards and, and you take my hand and say, I think the way you handle James 4.15 is not right. 
My response to that should not be to bristle with, I'm the preacher. Who do you think you are? I mean, that would be an absolutely insane, arrogant, stupid, imbecilic thing to say to you. I would say, I hope, what did I get wrong? And you would open your Bible and say, but what about this word? And I would say, hmm, maybe. I hadn't thought of that, which happens pretty often. Somebody asked me, have you thought of this? I said, never thought of that. Here's the verse I would go to, James 3.17. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, open to reason. The wisdom from above, pure, peaceable, come, let us reason together. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. Tell me where you think I made a mistake. I'll tell you why I don't think it was a mistake. Can we try to persuade each other? The good old-fashioned way, not calling out and tweeting. So humility knows that God has made provision for unshakable human conviction as well. Listen, 2 Corinthians 5.11, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men can't be wobbly on that if you're going to persuade men. Or Titus 2.15, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Whoa, whoa. So you, you can't seek to persuade anyone humbly if you have no convictions. You can't speak humbly with authority if you have no convictions. Now, let me, we're almost done. If somebody comes to you and, and they say relativism is really the humble posture, you can't really know what the truth is, and your truth and my truth might both be right, and we just can't know, and your truth and my truth are equally good. We just need to go our own way. And a lot of people say, but that, that's a really humble posture. It's not. You know why it's not a humble posture? Because if there are no objective truths that you can know, then you're free to be your own God. Which is very attractive to fallen human beings like me. I would like being God, except that I love God. But if I didn't know God, I think there's nothing I'd rather be than God. Like tell you all what to do, you know, how to serve me, do what I make me happy. So if there are no objective truths that I have to submit to as realities outside myself, I'm God. Do what I want to do. A judge and jury in every controversy. Me. It looks like a humble posture. It's not a humble posture. It's cloaking pride. I will do my own thing. Thank you very much. And you better stay out of my face because my truth is my truth. And it's as good as your truth. That's not a humble posture. Humility submits to objective reality. That's a pulpit. I'm not going to smash my head against it and think it's a cloud. It's a pulpit. It's made out of wood, I think. It's wood. Very hard. I would hurt myself. I submit to that reality. It's out there. I can't do anything about it. I'm not God. And I submit to reality and truth. That's the humble posture. I don't say, I'm God. I can get through that. So humility knows that its grasp of reality is fallible on the one hand, and that there is such a thing as objective truth, and that by God's grace, He has made a way for us to. See the truth, submit to it, and proclaim it, and stake our lives on it. Now, at the bottom of these five traits is this conviction. Humility senses that humility, humility senses that humility is a gift beyond our reach. If humility is the product of reaching, 
I will boast that I have reached it. Humility is the self-forgetful gift that receives all things as a gift. Or as Paul said, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. A fruit of the gospel. Knowing and feeling that I'm a desperate sinner. And that Christ is a great savior. An undeserved savior. Or one could say, Christian humility is the greatest, or Christian humility in the greatest cultural conflicts is the fruit of serious joy. Joy in the immeasurable, unshakable, undeserved riches of Christ. So here's my closing exhortation to all of us. One, submit to Christ as supreme. Two, don't expect to be treated better than Jesus. Three, tell the truth in love for Christ's sake. Four, receive all of life as grace. Five, be teachable but not wishy-washy. Be done with all boasting in men. For all things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So stand firm in serious joy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray now that you would take whatever I have said that's true and by your spirit, seal it to every mind and heart in this room. If I have said anything amiss, that's where we need canceling. You do the canceling. And I pray that you would unite us in the kind of serious joy that comes from Christian education that leads us into liberty in our interactions with the culture rather than control and makes us humble. I pray this in Jesus' name.